Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to InShip's lecture series. Um, I'm Lisa Eaton. I'm a professor of human development in family sciences, and I'm super excited today to be introducing uh, Dr. Duncan. Um, Dr. Duncan uh, received his doctorate of science in social and behavioral sciences um, from Harvard University. He also received his master's degree there as well and received his Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Morehouse College. <clears throat> he currently um, serves as an associate professor at Columbia University. He's a former visiting scientist at George Washington University, or excuse me, he's currently a visiting scientist at George Washington University. He's formerly an associate professor at New York University. Um, and is also currently has um, been a visiting scientist since 2013 at the French National Institute of Health um, and Medical Research. And so, as I mentioned, I'm very excited um, about Dr. Duncan's presentation today. And um, please join me in, in welcoming him. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Always technology. Okay, hold on. Oh, I should say too that we'll have um, a Q and A as, as you're kind of getting set up and your slides organized. We we do definitely have time for a Q and A um, at the end of the session. Um, it's scheduled to start around one fifteen, but we can be flexible on time. So um, unless unless um, Dustin, unless you'd like questions as you go, do you have any preference? Um, no, no strong preference. A little bit more in the ends. I'll kind of just I can keep the cadence. Excuse me, moving, but if, if there's a pressing question, please reach out, of course. Okay. Make All sure right. that Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So thanks, Lisa, um, and um, everyone for the invitation. I'm excited, really, about this um, talk. Um, and again, as I was telling Lisa earlier, I'm a little disappointed, of course, that we um, are not in person because I think the dynamic would be a little bit different. But so today I'm going to talk about HIV disparities among gay, uh, black, bisexual, and other sexual minority men. Um, it's a focus on um, one of our cohort studies, um, uh, the N2 cohort study. Okay, just a little bit of background of who I am, only because I think that it's really important because I think that the training that we get um, really shapes kind of how we approach our science. Um, so my training is is substantively in social and spatial epidemiology. Um, I was at NYU for a couple of years and I've been um, at Columbia for about a year, um, where I'm super happy. There's a lot of a, a strong um, and senior people who study HIV and um, many of the intersectional populations that uh, I'm interested in. So my main research interests are in um, social epidemiology, spatial epidemiology, infectious disease epidemiology, sleep epidemiology, really as it applies to intersectional minority health. And I'll try to touch on those topics here. So first I'm gonna do um, some defining, so defining sexual and gender minority populations. I'll talk about black, gay, and bisexual women mainly, and HIV disparities. I'll talk about what's known as the black MSM paradox. I'll talk through um, a little bit about multi-level models and population level HIV um, uh, uh, acquisition and prevention. Uh, uh, most of, of my work has been on the prevention side, and, our, and N2 has a large uh, prevention component. So I'll talk about multi-level barriers to PrEP use among MSM, um, with the focus on Black MSM. And then I'll try to introduce some of the uh, N2 overall, but some of the, the kind of uh, uh, study, the other studies that we're doing in the cohort. So I'm going to define sexual minority population, just because I think definitions are important. So uh, sexual orientation um, refers to an enduring pattern or disposition to experience sexual or romantic desires for um, and for and relationships with people of particular genders, and so we operationalize it really in three ways: uh, sexual or behavior, sexual attraction, and identity. Um, uh, sexual behavior uh, really refers to an enduring pattern of sexual or romantic activity with people of particular genders, while sexual attraction really speaks to sexual or romantic feelings for people of particular genders. And finally, identity is uh, can be somewhat of a complex uh, construct, but uh, it, it's usually a sense of membership in a particular group. For example, being gay, bisexual, or something else, by gender, et cetera. So I think the interesting thing here, and I, I taught a class yesterday on SGM um, um, uh, uh, health, and, and I presented this slide to students. 
But I think it's interesting that, you know, each of these three dimensions of sexual orientation um, don't necessarily have, are, are, are quite distinct and there is a, a low correlation. So we see that, um, and I'll show you the particular study, a study by, a recent study by Fritz and Kruger found that, you know, when we look at correlation between the three dimensions, we see it's only 30% uh, among men. And we see that that number is lower among women. I've been doing some kind of, uh, literature reviews to kind of see the consistency of, of these correlations. Um, not, nothing systematic, but it's interesting that all the studies that I've uh, reviewed, the, the correlations uh, similarly seem to be relatively low, and they're especially low for women. And this is just a slide uh, uh, from the actual paper that, that demonstrates the, the amount of overlap between the three uh, constructs and, and the different constructs overall. So there's some additional terms that I, I just want to uh, highlight just because increasingly I've been thinking about terminology. So one is cisgender. The term cisgender refers to those gender identity that matches or are consistent with their assigned or expressed gender. Uh, MSM, you know, larger term that we use um, as epidemiologists, um, uh, really state, stem from the HIV epidemic uh, and the CDC. It includes a gay bisexual men, but also applies to men who are heterosexual, but also at times have uh, uh, sex with men, uh, et cetera. So recently we did a, a commentary, and I wasn't able to update all my slides on using the additional um, uh, or new terms, but we, we, we called for not an abandoning, but, but you know, uh, being th thoughtful and perhaps not using the term MSM always. And we discussed, um, a, a, a postdoc in our group, Leah Timmons and I, uh, a, a potential way forward is using the, the term sexual minority health. We're not saying that it's a panacea at all. Um, and we don't think that it's the only term and there are certainly challenges in it, but I just wanna be mindful about terminology. So when we think about uh, HIV um, and MSM, um, uh, the, the original, uh, 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 one original model that really conceptualized or thought about HIV acquisition was the syndemic model, which says that, you know, MSM and other populations really experience um, uh, not one health uh, issue, but really a, 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 a several health issues which synergistically produce poor health, including HIV. So, for example, MSM have um, high rates of substance use, as well as high rates of of mental health burdens, and not just the, not those two factors independently influence HIV risk, which is true, but synergistically give rise to HIV disparities. So I'm going to talk about again now um, moving to Black MSM and HIV disparities. Um, I remember when this article came out in the New York Times a couple of years ago. Many of my friends and colleagues, you know, sent me this as as one person who studies Black MSM, and but it really highlighted the at least in uh, a, a resurgence of interest and attention to uh, Black MSM and particularly HIV disparities um, with a focus on the South. I'm gonna, I'll talk about some of that work in a second. So globally, we, we know that gay men and other metastatal men are 27 times more likely to have HIV uh, to be at risk for HIV than the general population. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that it's really consistent across contexts. So sometimes we see effect modification or differences um, um, in, in prevalence estimates uh, by geography, but we don't really, we, we see differences in prevalences, but the, the pattern is, is the same, where we see the MSM have, seen, have significantly higher uh, prevalence of HIV, you know, from Sub-Saharan Africa to Asia to Europe, uh, et cetera. And so here in the States, we know that MSM are the, the, the largest uh, risk group for HIV acquisition. But what we don't often talk about or uh, what, what's not immediately talked about is that there are strong racial differences here. So while it's estimated that, you know, one in six MSM in a lifetime will be diagnosed with HIV, that number is markedly different um, when it comes to race ethnicity. So we know that, you know, one in two or 50 percent of black MSM lifetimes will HIV, require HIV, you know, which is quite stark compared to the one in 11 in uh, white MSM. And perhaps what's um, concerning is we don't just see disparities in HIV acquisition, but we really see disparities in, in across the HIV continuum of care. So black MSM are less likely to have healthcare visits, less likely to be ART adherent, and also less likely to be virally suppressed. And I'm increasingly interested in TASP and, you know, viral suppression as a, as a health outcome for HIV prevention at a population level. Um, but other thing we don't necessarily always talk about is that, you know, there is certainly, you know, um, uh, differences in the prevalence of HIV across geographies, where the prevalence of HIV is significantly higher in the South, especially among Black and Muslim. And these are just some, some figures taken from different sources, including AIDS view demonstrating that. Um, so I, I, just, I just want to highlight again here that Oh, someone asked for data on indigenous populations. I'll, I'll bring that up um, 
in a, a later, so we can circle back. But these are some of the, the areas um, uh, uh, with the, these are our metropolitan areas in 2007 that has the highest prevalence of, of HIV and uh, the, 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 the cities or, or metropolitan areas in yellow, I think that's yellow, are places in the, that are located in the south. And we see that most of these places with the highest prevalence of HIV are in the south. For example, Jackson, Mississippi, Columbia, South Carolina, Atlanta, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, New Orleans, et cetera. So just briefly, I saw, um, uh, uh, someone gave a talk the other day that, that talked about the, you know, the wide range of HIV prevention uh, metrics we can use, uh, which are condoms to mutual monogamy, uh, male circumcision, circumcision, you know, untouchable viral load, absence, et cetera. And that when it comes to HIV prevention products, there's a wide range of products, including uh, 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 an oral pill, I prep. Um, there's been a lot of work, you know, looking at long-lasting injectable cabotegravir, so injections, et cetera. Um, prep really is, I think, the the standard uh, 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 novel, quote unquote, uh, HIV prevention metric. Which uh, there are different formulas, but you know, the, the 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 most studied formula and most effective is using prep once a day. So this is just some data that shows that. PrEP significantly reduces um, the risk for HIV acquisition. So this is some, some data that shows that, um, you know, it, it daily PrEP uh, adherence is associated with a 90, it's 90% uh, effective in preventing HIV acquisition in different sub high risk subgroups, including MSM, high risk heterosexuals, injection drug users. But the, I think the interesting thing to note here is that really efficacy is really correlated with the degree of adherence. Um, these are some additional findings um, looking at long last long lasting injectable type cabotegravir. Also, you know, suggesting that there's some um, um, there there in terms of effectiveness in terms of HIV um, acquisition, reducing HIV acquisition. I think the other thing to note is that one different cities have um, a, a differential knowledge of uh, and use of. Uh, uh, of of pre exposure prophylaxis, but also the, the point here, and I know these are older data. But is that the, the, the prevalence of, of PrEP awareness, uh, as, as demonstrated here across cities, just has increased over time, which I think is good. But we also know that there are disparities in uh, PrEP awareness, and um, Black MSM have mixed awareness of an interest in PrEP. And see, there, these are different studies that show uh, the prevalence of, of PrEP awareness where, you know, it, some samples show the PrEP awareness to be relatively low, some were shown to be a little bit higher, but still uh, uh, less than 50% of Black MSM in all these studies you know, are, are, um, are not aware of PrEP. The other thing we, we know when it comes to disparities is that Black MSM really have a low uptake of PrEP. And it's really hard to compare studies for a number of reasons, the sample sizes, the geographies, the timeframes, you know, different campaigns that may be happening. But just overall, um, in our data, we can check about our data too, but there's just, especially given the disparities, there's just a relatively low uptake of PrEP, where some studies have, you know, prevalence estimates as low as 4%, um, and others are having about, you know, uh, uh, about a quarter of, of, of the sample. The other thing to note is that, you know, PrEP is really, a, there's a, a continuum of, of care when it comes to PrEP. So, of course, you have to be aware, willing, and then, you know, use PrEP. But also, you know, my research and, and other colleagues, Lisa's, et cetera, shows that people also cycle off of PrEP for various reasons, relationships, affordability, you know, maybe not having a, 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 a planned sector in that time period. And we see that there's a, that PrEP discontinuation is a really major issue uh, for Black MSM. Again, it's really hard to, uh, to summarize the exact estimates because the study, the sample size is very significantly, again, in terms of the geography, um, income, um, uh, uh, time frame, i.e. the date the study was conducted. But we see uh, uh, the prevalence estimates of as high as uh, uh, 60 to 70 percent of Black MSM that can discontinue their PrEP. Um, so just briefly to give a, a quick overview of the different modalities as it really speaks to kind of what we're what we're studying or what we plan to study is, you know, emerging modalities include uh, for PrEP include uh, uh, taking PrEP daily, event driven or 211, injectables um, and implants. Um, and the new formulas are, are Trivada, which is the, the, the standard and Discovy. And I, I recently learned there's um, a, 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 a generic version of, of Trivada. I think it was released in the summer. So. 
researchers have talked about the, this black MSM paradox. What is that? So it really says that compared to the white MSM counterparts, black MSM have fewer sexual partners, uh, less condomless sex, and equal, depending uh, on the drug and depending on the um, uh, the sample, but equal or, or, or less drug use. Um, overall, there's caveats, particularly when it comes to marijuana use. Um, but the, the paradox is, you know, despite that black MSM have fewer uh, and less condomless sex compared to white uh, MSM, the black MSM still have a significantly higher potency of, H a, a of estimates of, of HIV. The question is why? Um, so a little bit more context, I think it's helpful. One, the high prevalence of incidence of HIV uh, it, it's already there among a, a black MSM, and we know that black MSM have a high risk of, of uh, STI, STI acquisition, others, uh, non-HIV STIs, including syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. So we know that there's a, a high prevalence of non-HIV STIs in the population. Um, and we also know that black MSM are more likely than other racial groups to select partners of the same racial group. And the other thing that we know, or at least it's been positive in the literature, is Elon Meyer's um, 2003 uh, 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 discussion of the minority stress model, which really says that minority status and minority identity, including based on sexual orientation, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, and other statuses, is associated with poor health. He, he talked about it in the context of mental health, but it's applied, been applied to substance use, HIV, et cetera. And the, the, the pit of the the, the the model really argues that yes that you know people in, in, in our day-to-day -day interactions in our social world experience stressors but there's something about being a minority at multiple levels proximally things like uh, discrimination and also distantly um uh, 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 things like uh, uh, policies like structural stigma um give rise to these disparities including um high rates of HIV. So I'm going to talk about uh, introduce a multi-level model size thinking um, and how this relates to HIV. So uh, Bill Schrank is a former C C C C senior vice president and chief medical officer of CBS Health, and I just really like this quote that he said, which he said that health happens in between visits to the doctor. So what he's saying is that yes, the healthcare environment is important, and he's a physician, so I appreciate you know that perspective. But there are other contexts of our lives that really influence our health, such as where we go to school, where we go, where we live where we work, et cetera. And so this is just a, a multi-level model that relates um, to HIV, suggesting that they're individual, network, community, and higher level factors that relate to HIV acquisition. So the individual level is really this first level. It depends on primarily on biological, cognitive, and perceptual um, factors associated with acquisition and transmission of risk. The second level is really this neighborhood level, it includes social networks, family networks, sexual networks, um, and just some SGM um, specific um, influences. It could be uh, late night uh, social events and stress associated with um, someone's network accepting someone's sexual and gender identity. So neighbor level is really the third level. It determines access to prevention resources, treatment and care services, as well as other type of resources that um, are useful for maintaining health, such as healthy food stores, uh, healthcare facilities, et cetera. It also could include physical exposure, such as air pollutants and noise. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, we did the study called the NYC Low Income Housing Neighbors and Health Study. And in that study, uh, many of the participants, uh, social, socially, I'm um, pretty outgoing, you know, started talking about their, their, the study and really how it related to their thinking about their neighborhoods. And so a, a colleague and really friend of mine from uh, college, we ended up doing this documentary called uh, Bad Neighbors Affect Your Health? Question mark, the story of low-income housing residents. And this is just one still from the documentary where this uh, uh, participant now, a uh, person in, in the documentary, really talked about um, her neighborhood structure in a really substantive and uh, thoughtful way. And she basically described that in her neighborhood, that people didn't really care about her. Um, and she basically said, and, and, and people in the community, and she specifically said that they don't really care about us in the hood. And what she was describing is that in her neighborhood, which is described as the hood, there was a, a minimal to no place where she can eat healthfully. Um, and so she described basically having to go outside of her neighborhood, which was costly and uh, other issues that um, for her to eat healthfully. And so, Overall, the research shows that neighbors matters. We need to invest in neighborhoods, but I'm going to show you some work that relates to that with HIV. And there's been many um, books, products about neighbors and health. This is just one a book that I, I co-edited with Achiro Kwachi about two years ago, but it really summarizes the field of neighbors and health, if that's of interest. 
So there's so many studies um, from colleagues that have looked at neighbors and health, um, including as it relates to HIV. And this is just one study, one of our studies, who we used data from um, a, a sample of Black MSM mainly in Atlanta, Georgia, and Jackson, Mississippi. Excuse me, we defined neighborhoods based on individuals' perception. The sample included almost 400 um, Black MSM. And so what did we find? We found that in, compared to those in the lowest tertile, those uh, who report more neighborhood problems um, were essentially more likely to, uh, to report uh, drug use before and during sex. This is a study by Homo, Ho, Jose Baumeister, Lisa Eaton, and Rob Stevenson that used a multi-level analysis to look at neighborhood social economic disadvantage and transitional sex um, among uh, a young MSM in Detroit. They defined neighbors as a census tract, had a sample of um, almost 320 uh, young MSM, and among other findings, they found that greater social uh, neighborhood socioeconomic disadvantage was associated with higher frequency of engagement in transactional sexual behavior. So uh, networks also matter. We, we kind of discussed that briefly. Um, and so this is some work that shows that um, people who are bridgers who connect two different social networks uh, have a higher risk of, of HIV, uh, of being HIV uh, infected. And this is just uh, another uh, uh, paper by a colleague of mine, John Snyder, who shows that um, uh, uh, networks can matter in terms of HIV acquisition. So we've done some work, not a lot, but connecting neighbors and networks. Um, and so in one's early study, we found that greater frequency with, uh, in, in terms of communication with one social network members, um, or particularly social support network members, was associated with um, concordance between one's residential and social neighborhoods. So I want to talk about some uh, multi-level barriers to prep use um, uh, with a focus on Black MSM. So this is an early study we did where we found that, you know, there are multiple barriers in a multi-ethnic uh, and racial sample of, of MSM, including being concerned. And these are just um, prevalence, uh, uh, like table one, but we also found, you know, these in our multivariable models, but uh, being concerned about side effects is associated with, uh, 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 as a barrier to prep use, as well as um, uh, not knowing where to get it, not being able to afford it, et cetera. Um, Samples of Black MSM have reported stigma when it comes to PrEP use. So um, uh, a study that Lisa conducted found that believing that PrEP um, is for people who are promiscuous, so stigma belief was strongly associated with a lack of interest in PrEP. And there's been a lot of work um, that I've really appreciated looking at medical mistrust in PrEP use. And uh, essentially, the vast majority of studies from my reading literature demonstrate, not surprisingly, that medical mistrust is associated with a less various PrEP uh, outcomes, but including a uh, less willingness and, and use of PrEP. And partially, perhaps due to, as, as the study found, um, not being comfortable talking to a healthcare provider about sex, having sex with men. Um, so what about findings at the network level as it may relate to um, a PrEP use? So this is a, a study um, of, of Black MSM. I believe it was a qualitative study. Um, in London, and essentially they found that Black MSM reported exclusion from male, um, gay male uh, spaces, both online and offline. And they described, and the authors went on to describe, which I appreciated, um, that it could serve as a barrier to uh, exposure to prep messaging. And so this is some work from our group where we found that um, uh, uh, greater prep awareness uh, in, in Black MSM was associated uh, with uh, sexual network members residing in the same neighborhood as the participants and having discussions around avoiding uh, HIV with, with your friends, i.e. your confidants. So what about the neighborhood level? There's been very little work to my knowledge about neighborhoods in my read the literature, uh, neighbors and prep use. But this is just one early study that we conducted where we found that um, higher neighborhood, uh, among other things, higher neighborhood education and greater neighborhood um, uh, a primary care density was associated with greater prep awareness among Black MSM. So just to summarize kind of what that was, and I know that was a lot, but that multi-level factors really influenced prep use among Black MSM at the individual network and neighborhood level. And these are just some examples here, there. But, you know, I, I didn't dig too deep into the studies, but there's just a, a wide range of limitations that I want us to be aware of, and I want to really talk about how our group is trying to, you know, build on our, our colleagues' studies. Um, the vast majority of studies are still at the individual level, and many studies use uh, 
crude neighbor and network metrics, and really, you know, not taking um, a, account of the, for, for the social context. So I'm going to talk about some future research, and the future research from my perspective is really thinking about the context more, including neighbors and networks, and really embracing intersectionality theory and methods, and I'll describe um, the, the latter now. So intersectionality really speaks to Similar to uh, as endemic theory, it's not about one factor that relates to health, but it's really about the synergy of different factors, and it, uh, 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 and these really um, uh, synergistically influence health. So, ex as an example, um, I, I, gender identity and race and sexual orientation independently relate to health, and you know many studies have shown that. But the synergistic effects of gender, race, and sexual orientation interact to produce different uh, expressions of privilege and power which relates to oppression and, and, and one's experience and therefore, and then subsequently health. Excuse me, and intersectionality theory is really about um, uh, the, the privilege and power uh, uh, that's really central to the theory. And so this is just one quote from uh, a, a, a study that Lisa Bolle conducted. Uh, it's a qualitative study with Black MSM. And I just really like this quote from Nigel, who's 37. He said the following. Well, it's hard for me to separate my identities. When I'm thinking of me, I'm thinking of all of them as me. Like once you've blended the cake, you can't take back parts to the main ingredients. I'm a gay man. Also, there's something to say about the aspects of being a black man. And so he essentially talks about his identities of him being black and being gay, and, and really that these things are like, uh, uh, he, you can't divorce them. So, you know, oftentimes in research, um, uh, uh, studies have, essentially combined uh, medicines of men and transgender women, um, really um, obscuring differences in, in health and risk in these communities. Um, and so I wanted to present some work that shows that basically we shouldn't do that. Um, and our studies have, you know, similarly sometimes have done that, and, and, um, but overall, I think that we should be mindful uh, of, of, of this issue. Um, so this is a study that was conducted in Atlanta among Black MSM and Black transgender women, and it found that uh, Black transgender women were significantly more likely to report lower educational attainment, be homeless, and have engaged in transactional sex. Um, we followed up this study. It was really inspiration to our work um, in Chicago, where we compared Black MSM with Black transgender women again, and we found that Black transgender women had less stable sexual networks, um, greater sexual network turnover, uh, more sexual partners, more transactional sex, so similar, and less income. And this is a study uh, where one of my doctoral students um, uh, 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 developed a wrote um, where we did the same thing with a, 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 a sample of Black MSM in Jackson and Atlanta and, and, and Black gender women. And we found that Black uh, gender women were significantly more likely to report being straight, uh, more likely to report being unemployed, and in this study, more likely to be living in Atlanta. And so there's a wide range of intersectional positions that one could study. Um, Mainly, we talked about them at the individual level, but you know we can think about intersectionality also at higher levels, which we're trying to do, including thinking about geography and taking geography seriously. So there's a, a, a range of methodological approaches to study intersectionality. Um, one is really focusing on a particular population that we believe is intersectional. Another is looking at uh, examining formally effect modification or stratification. And then there are other approaches that you know we're flirting with and, and learning, which are really using like latent class uh, as an example, latent class analysis to study um, uh, 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 intersectionality. And so this is uh, uh, one paper that we published um, uh, this year, but it was I think you know it was probably published like uh, accepted about a year ago, where we looked at stressful life events and sexual risk behaviors among uh, Black MSM in our sample. And not surprisingly, we found that stressful life events was associated with sexual risk behaviors. But we were interested in the experience of incarceration as an intersectional position. And we, not, perhaps not surprisingly, found that those who are previously incarcerated, and you know, there are many limitations of our study in terms of you know, our incarceration measures, rather crude. But we found that the experience of being incarcerated is, was particularly salient. So we found that these effects were especially uh, isolated for those who are incarcerated. So it, it really speaks to. Um, one's experience of, uh, of incarceration being really salient to uh, their experience of stress and, and how it relates to or, or gives rise to a hybrid sexual behavior. So there's been a number of studies that uh, a colleagues have conducted, which you know, we've built on and we think are, are great, um, that study Black MSM. These are just uh, some of them here. Uh, Element, uh, You Connect, Power. And I'm going to talk about our N2 cohort study now. 
Um, and two, uh, thankfully, it's funded by an R1 from NIMH and a CDC um, uh, 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 mechanism. Um, uh, here at Columbia, uh, I'm the PI, and we have, um, we're really the coordinating center between our three sites, uh, serving our four sites, and our external advisory committee, which I didn't put on this slide, but we have a site in Chicago, a site in Jack, uh, that John Snyder and Russell Brewer are leading, uh, uh, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, New Orleans, and Baton Rouge. Um, our main aims are to look at cross-sectional longitudinal associations between neighborhoods um, as defined by GPS activity spaces and HIV prevention and care behaviors, um, to look at how networks relate to HIV prevention and care behaviors, and then to look at interactive effects between neighbors and networks as related to HIV prevention and care behaviors. And so this is a conceptual model that we are that we developed for our study. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about this, but we, 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 we've sampled some um, HIV positive um, black MSM uh, as we're, we are increasingly recognizing the importance of viral suppression and, and, and uh, its, its, its uh, factors such as uh, AOT adherence. So in our sample, we have 600 black MSM, uh, mainly the, the bulk of the samples in Chicago. Um, um, so what do we do? We collect uh, survey data, measured health data, for example, HIV, HIV status, of course. Um, we, we have uh, objective viral load data um, from, our, from one of our clinics. Uh, we have uh, address and GIS data, we have GPS data, and we have social and sexual network data. So now I'm gonna talk about the data structures just to dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, or sorry, the design, then the data structures. So the design really is quite simple. Um, the cohorts for two years, um, in our Chicago site, um, uh, we give participants a survey, we uh, uh, distribute the GPS device, and they return this, the GPS device. I'll talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted that. Um, it certainly has. And we, we get funding for an additional wave, uh, so uh, cycle six, and we're uh, feverishly writing grants to understand what we've learned so far and also to you know continue our cohort, which we think is important. So we're hopeful that one of them um, is funded. Um, due to the structure of funding, we are, the, the cohort in the South is just one year, um, but uh, 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 yeah. So the other differences are that, you know, in Chicago, we're really using, um, I, I would say, a more rigorous approach to sampling. We're using RDS um, to sample participants, so really coming from our previous studies. And in, in this, our Southern sites, it just really wasn't possible we went with our cab. So what we're doing um, and have done really is community-based recruitment. Um, uh, our Jackson site participants also came from our past studies, but definitely in New Orleans and Jackson, in, in Baton Rouge, excuse me, it's mainly community-based recruitment. In Baton Rouge, a little bit from a, a clinic that we're associated with. Um, we have flyers. This is a flyer from our, our, our New Orleans site. Um, Pre-COVID, we um, put some of these uh, things on social media. Um, we've had many, I mean, not now, but in, uh, previously uh, in-person events at clubs, bars, et cetera. And this is just a, a, a party that we hosted um, to, uh, for our participants, for participants to, to know about the study and also for our participants who are in the study to, to feel a connection with the study. Um, in our questionnaire, we ask, uh, we deliver in multiple ways. Um, it's a mixture of self-administered and interview administered. We assess a wide range of characters beyond neighbors and networks, uh, mental health, substance use, or life experiences, et cetera. Um, so our protocol for assessing neighborhoods is two ways. One, be a self-report, but also be a GPS. So we ask participants to wear the GPS monitor for 14 days. Uh, and then we ask them to complete a travel diary, um, including questions like, did you charge the device? Um, so you may be asking yourself, well, Dustin, that's really great, but you know, why would you waste your time with this method? It sounds a little bit cumbersome and you know, maybe unnecessary. So a lot of my early work was really thinking about the idea of misclassification when it came to neighborhoods. When I was a doctoral student, I really didn't understand why we say neighbors in crude ways. For example, census tracts. Um, and so I did some empirical, uh, uh, theoretical and then empirical work to uh, investigate this idea of, say this concept of spatial misclassification, which really refers to the incorrect measurement of a neighbor exposure based on the definition used. So here we see that we define neighbors as census tracts. We would say that, you know, people in census tract A have no access to parks, or people in census tract B do. But, you know, if we look at that spatial distribution of where people come from, that's just not true. And so you would actually, you know, estimate the exposure uh, uh, completely incorrectly. And so again, I've demonstrated this um, 
work uh, visually, and, but also empirically, where we see that neighbor definition really influences what those boundaries are. And in this paper, um, the neighbor exposure was tobacco retailers for youth, but we empirically show that the neighbor definition really influences people's exposures. The other issue that GPS methods allow us to overcome is this idea, the idea of the residential trap. Um, the residential, residential trap refers to the exclusive focus on the residential environment. Um, however, as you can imagine, maybe not as silly in COVID period, but our um, times, we spend time generally in different neighborhoods. So from home to work, um, you know, maybe we uh, drop our, 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 our child off at school, maybe from home, from work to home, we go to the grocery store uh, in preparation for dinner, maybe we meet a friend, et cetera. And so this idea of spatial polygamy argued by um, uh, geographer John Odlin and reintroduced in the public health literature by Stephen Matthews. The idea that we live matters, where we work, socialize, play, where we shop, and it also says that uh, uh, the, not just these distinct con uh, contexts, but the commuting, com the community corridor or path between these contexts really can potentially influence our health. So I wanted to uh, early on investigate or study whether you know this idea of spatial polygamy was real or not, or whether it's you know just this academic concept. So there was a cohort of uh, 600 uh, uh, young MSM in New York City. We asked them where they lived, where they socialized, where they had sex. And essentially, we um, asked this question in such a crude way where some participants said, well, this is a specific address. Some people said, well, this is the neighborhood name. Some people said, well, this is the borough. And so what we did is we aggregated everything up to the borough level to uh, minimize, uh, uh, um, uh, to maximize the data. And we found that 75% of participants did not reside, socialize, and have sex within the same neighborhoods. And so again, I think if, uh, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with New York City, but Boroughs are, are are quite big. They're equivalent to their counties, essentially. And so if we were to dig deeper, even something at a census tract level, we would see probably significantly more spatial mobility or polygamy. There are many GPS methods that one could use. Um, we've used a dedicated GPS device, and this one in particular, or QSTAR, um, for many reasons, one um, of which is highly accurate. And so from that GPS data, we are able to, you know, then uh, a GPS device, we're able to get people's mobility patterns. And so some of our early work showed that, you know, it was feasible to do this with MSM samples, including black MSM samples in the, in, in the South. Um, and you know, um, from this work, we've also demonstrated um, BNR21 that, and this paper I think is now out in spatial spatial temporal epidemiology, that, you know, spatial polygamy as measured by GPS um, exists. And so I'll just share, share one finding here. Um, we geolocated all of the census tracts where participants lived. Um, so participants in our study um, in New York City lived in 184 census tracts um, out of the uh, over or almost uh, 2,200 census tracts in New York City. And what did we do? We, we looked at where GPS data was found, and we found GPS data in over 2,000 of those census tracts. So it suggests that um, participants um, are moving across census tracts. And I didn't present it here, but we also, I believe in the paper, and if we didn't do the paper, we, we did it for our internal team, but created box plots to see, to make sure that it wasn't like one participant, you know, traveling everywhere. And we see that it actually is, you know, the vast majority of people are, are traveling. It's not one participant that's driving these data. So there are different ways to uh, assess um, social networks, the ego, uh, egocentric approach, a sociometric approach, uh, egocentric approach, really, um, you ask the person about their networks and a sociometric approach, you're really connecting people. In our study, we're doing both. Um, uh, a network questionnaire uh, includes things like um, um, uh, 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 asking people, for example, their top 10 closest social network members, like their life partner, their boyfriend, their family members, et cetera. Um, and two, we're asking about their five confidant members, so uh, people who are, are, are close to their social network, um, uh, as well as their five uh, last sexual partners. Um, in, in our study, we are allowing um, uh, uh, the confidant and sexual network members to overlap. And then we ask a wide range of they're quite long questionnaires about uh, aspects of each network member, their age, their gender, their race, ethnicity, et cetera. Oops, sorry. Um, so again, many studies focus just on the egocentric approach, and in our study, we're doing that as well, but we're also matching participants in our study who know each other um, uh, based on collecting uh, um, their cell phone uh, contact list data and their Facebook uh, data. So we're assessing many health outcomes, HIV prevention outcomes for uh, HIV negative participants like PrEP, 
but for our positive participants, which we recently included um, uh, measuring um, ART adherence, um, and for our, our, our negative and HIV positive participants, we're measuring also a wide range of, 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 of behaviors um, and factors such as receptive anal uh, condylist, receptive anal intercourse, and um, uh, uh, substance use in the context of sex. And so this is just a, a figure, and I'll just leave it up for a second, where it, it, it discusses some of our key variables and where we are, where, we, where they are in the cycle. We had a meeting yesterday where we're, we're planning cycle six, so this will be updated soon. Um, so we published our, our baseline paper, um, really the methods paper, a couple of years ago in uh, the International Journal for Environmental Research and Public Health. Um, this needs to be updated a little bit, but we're, we're actually in the cohort. Um, and, and in the uh, Chicago site, we have a retention rate as of yesterday of 94%, which we're excited about. Um, so just a little bit about our sample. Um, the mean age of our sample was 34 or is 34. Um, our sample is, is definitely marginalized where we see that 67% uh, of participants report less than 75, uh, sorry, $25,000 uh, annual income. We see that the th about 30% of our sample report being um, homeless and about 55, 56% of our sample report being gay. And those are HIV, and this is the self-reported data, um, about 64% report being HIV positive. And we see, uh, perhaps interestingly, that 64% report never having taken PrEP. And this is interesting for a couple of reasons, but one of which were associated with several clinics. So sampling came from clinics, so it's kind of interesting and surprising that that number was so high. Um, there are many neighbor characteristics we study, and so it's, it's hard to pull out all of them here, but I'll just talk about one of them, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. One finding we found is that, um, and we're doing some work on this, and I'll show you, share it within a second, is that 67% of participants report police harassment in neighborhoods, but interestingly, also 65% of participants report a lack of police pre uh, uh, presence in their neighborhoods. So, you know, we didn't do any follow-up follow qualitative work, but what this could suggest is that police aren't in Black neighborhoods, um, but when they are, they are harassing uh, participants, including Black MSM. And I'll talk, I'll dig deeper into that in a second. And we found the, uh, uh, many, uh, 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 there are many uh, 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 sociodemographic uh, 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 interesting findings of people's uh, social and sexual network members. So we've been interested in, I, and, and I talked about earlier, um, measures of sexual orientation and how that relates to health uh, overall. And so we found that uh, bisexual participants, particularly bisexual uh, identified participants who have sex with, so in terms of behavior, uh, men and women have the, the lowest rates of, of, of PrEP use, um, uh, current PrEP use. And this is a, a paper that is not no longer in preparation, it's, it's, it's in review. And we have a paper where we looked at, um, with N2 so far, how social environmental factors, particularly resilience related factors, uh, influence PrEP uh, and viral suppression in our sample. And so one thing we found is that having a, a parental figure um, within someone's uh, a, a confidant network uh, membership was associated with increased likelihood of PrEP use. And so these are just some of the additional papers that we're, we're working on, including some work about neighbor police violence, which I'm excited to share some of the preliminary findings. Um, so in this data set, we're excited that we have longitudinal GPS data, and we uh, one of my doctoral students is working with, with, for a dissertation, and we're really um, um, trying to, to, to conceptualize like longitudinal GPS data. Um, I think this is uh, among the first uh, data sets, human data sets with longitudinal GPS data, but uh, I'll, I'll just share, uh, this is just one participant, but this is one participant in Chicago over a year's time frame, And the, the overlap uh, here are the points that, the similar points of, of path or mobility in their, in their participant over, over uh, the, the year time point. But this is them at baseline, six months later, and then a year later. Um, I've been heavily interested in sleep, for a number of reasons, um, we've there are tremendous uh, disparities when it comes to sleep among sexual minority men, and we, 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 we've demonstrated that there's a, a high prevalence of poor sleep health among MSM, um, and then also that it's associated with health. It's just some some pictures just to highlight that you know sleep is I think been in vogue in some ways in terms of it being uh, uh, discussed in the in the media. Um, and sleep has been described really as fuel in our tank. And, you know, I, I gave a talk uh, to some sleep audiences sometimes, but, you know, when I was first entering it, I was just really fascinated that sleep is literally associated with everything. And yesterday I met with a doctor student who's interested in, in, in cancer, and, and we were doing some, some talking about some studies that, that demonstrated sleep is also associated, associated excuse me, with a wide range of, of cancer outcomes. 
Um, but when it comes to MSM, um, sleep has been associated with, uh, and some of our early work, uh, uh, poor mental health, drug use, and sexual risk behaviors. And so in this early paper in Sleep Health, we found that a typical night's sleep less than seven hours was associated with condomless and receptive anal intercourse. And the interesting thing here is that we've replicated this study. So uh, Brett Miller, a colleague of mine from Hunter College, uh, uh, demonstrated that this same association existed um, in a, a completely different sample of MSM. Um, there's been some other work that's looked at uh, sleep as it relates to black MSM, finding similar uh, findings, including that sleep, um, poor sleep health, including as defined in this study by short situation, is associated with decreased condomless sex, um, uh, decreased condom use, excuse me, at the last uh, uh, anal sex interaction. And finally, you know, you may be saying, okay, this is great. You know, you said that sleep, you're studying sleep and sleep relates to HIV, and you're presenting a study with black MSM, but why, Dustin? Did it doesn't seem to be selling to black MSM. Well, there's been some emerging work that's explicitly looked at sleep um, and intersectionality. Um, this is one work from a colleague of mine, Billy Carreras, which he found that um, black MSM essentially had the, the among the highest rates of, of poor sleep health. And this is just one of the findings from this paper, but it found that black MSM or black gay men, excuse me, had a significantly higher odds of very short sleep compared to black heterosexual counterparts. Um, and Overall, perhaps not surprisingly, there, there are wide uh, 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 racial disparities in sleep. So uh, this finding is rather significant given the, the known this racial disparities in sleep, including that this study demonstrated or highlighted. So in cycle four, we've um, called it the into sleep study where we're doing some sleep research, really um, uh, trying to look at how sleep relates to prep. Um, we're giving participants first actigraphs, uh, sleep diary, and a sleep survey. Um, this is the, particularly the risk actigraph that participants are, are, are given, the actigraph GT9X. Um, we're collecting 14 days worth of data um, to look at a wide range of sleep outcomes, including sleep duration, uh, wake after sleep onset, et cetera. Um, this is just what the data would, would look like. This is uh, fictitious data, uh, but data from a, a potential participant. And this is just a conceptual model, uh, how we've thought about how sleep neighborhoods and networks and other contextual factors relate to sleep and how sleep may relate to HIV prevention um, behaviors and HIV transmission overall, and including pathways being executive function and stress. So in cycle five, um, uh, uh, we're, uh, 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 we're measuring sleep, and this should be really be cycle six. But cycle six, we're, we're cycle five. We have a sub study where we're measuring stress, and uh, future cycles we're measuring things like trauma, discrimination, uh, mindfulness, and uh, implementing uh, in cycle six uh, EMA or ecological momentary assessment protocol. So police violence. Um, I was just, and I'm almost done. I know I'm a little over time for questions, but. Um, this is a figure that um, I just saw fascinating. I don't remember where I got it from, but it's a police officer asking a, what I perceive to be a young black child, maybe six, um, asking the following: uh, "What do you what, what do you want when you what do you want to be? Excuse me, when you grow up?" And he said, "Alive." And so there's been uh, many uh, uh, increased uh, attention to uh, black boys and, and men not feeling safe in white neighborhoods, and you know explicit recognition that. Uh, uh, police violence or police use of force is associated with is, is, a, is a deadly um, a, a leading cause of death, especially among black boys and, and men, but also black women and gender nonconforming individuals. These are some pictures of that. So this is just one quote that I, I like. Uh, I like to, to 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 hear people's voice when it comes to their health and, and their social experiences. This is the Tedra Winram, who's Jacob uh, Blake's sister, who was a, a, a victim of police. He was a black man, a victim of police violence, and she said the following. I'm not sad, I'm not sorry, I'm angry, and I'm tired. I haven't cried one time. I stopped crying years ago. I'm numb. I've been watching police kill people who look like me for years. And so these are names uh, and pictures of some black men who've been killed. And I won't dig into a deep of uh, another lecture where I talk about um, just police violence among black men and particularly black gay men and other gender nonconforming, uh, 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 or sexual and gender uh, uh, minority uh, um, uh, black individuals. But uh, uh, George Floyd, you know, his uh, death where a police officer uh, need, uh, uh, kneeled on his neck for about nine minutes um, really has sparked a lot of um, uh, re-emergence of interest uh, in, in activism in terms of preventing police violence. 
It was featured in New Yorker, etc. And so I won't dig deep because of time uh, it, uh, deeply into his death, but one thing to, to note is that um, there were initially conflicting reports between the uh, county and the independent um, auditor, uh, autopsy uh, person. And so I think it's it, it's it's something to note because I think we, we uh, the autopsy reports are, are how we you know can code you know how someone dies. Um, lots of, of protests um, about George Floyd's death. Um, and again, time I, I won't dig into it deeply here, but the, the interesting thing about that, oh, not interesting but sad, I guess I'll say, is there are many wrongful deaths and a lot of, of, of violence that stemmed from that on the side of the police. And after his death, Rashad Brooks died, or was killed, excuse me, and, um, and so this uh, protester said the following, I had to change the sign to Rashad Brooks. So I'll, I'll just briefly talk about some uh, work uh, with police violence in black men. Um, this is a qualitative study, and the participants, uh, these are black men, they were black gay men or black other or, se or sexual minority men, but they found that um, that really um, witnessing and experiencing police, police violence really uh, began in childhood, it spanned uh, through emerging adulthood, that many of the uh, the men in the sample report uh, having traumatic, being a traumatic exposure, um, that what it, it meant it, it fostered distrust among the police, um, and it it, 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 it it encouraged them or made them feel uh, and, and uh, have a feeling of injustice and being hypervigilant. And so there's been many work, including a colleague of mine that Devin English uh, has uh, studied, looking at police violence uh, and discrimination as well to many health outcomes. But in Devin's paper, he found that police discrimination in the past year was associated with less police, uh, sorry, less uh, prep willingness. Um, so we're doing some work where we are explicitly assessing more items about police violence intentionally in Chicago and writing further grant proposals, um, including Chicago and New Orleans, to look at police violence, including in the COVID pandemic. So these are just some preliminary findings where we see that um, police violence report, uh, police harassment within neighborhoods is associated with, in our, in our vibrant models, alcohol and drug use during sex, as well as the earlier age of sexual debut, but it only persists um, in our multivariate models for age of sexual debut. And we found some preliminary associations between neighbor police violence and sleep, but it didn't persist in our multi-level models. And these are findings that we're still trying to understand. Um, but in, in, in our future ways, we're hoping to come to dig deeper into understanding the, the meaning of police violence uh, in our sample and uh, um, in our interactions. So we're, we're hoping to combine our GPS methods and EMA methods with a method called geographically explicit uh, uh, ecological monitoring assessment. And some of our, our preliminary studies show that you know, we, we can do so. Um, so COVID. Um, during the, the COVID period, we stopped our study like many other studies did, but we also decided that it was a, a, an opportunity to understand our sample further during this period. So from uh, April to July, we conducted a Zoom uh, survey. It, it varied because we changed the survey around a little bit, but I think it ended up being an hour, upwards to an hour and a half among our participants. Um, we asked many things about PrEP, uh, ART adherence, IPV, income, uh, substance use, um, and I'm working on a paper now um, where I'm looking at sleep, so I, I didn't present our, our other findings, but um, one finding is we found that marijuana use was overall higher in our sample, but we found there was a 71% uh, prevalence of marijuana in the past two weeks, which is really high um, in our sample of black MSM. We've also found that sleep health was a concern. Not surprisingly, many of our participants reported poor sleep health. And interestingly, we found that COVID-related stressors, in particular, in particular overall stress, not having enough medication, financial burden of traveling during the COVID period, intimate partner violence, housing instability, was associated with poor sleep health. And this is a paper I'm, I'm working on now. Um, we recognize that there are the, the disparities that, that uh, we talked about global earlier, um, and HIV is, isn't specific just to Black MSM in the U.S., but Black MSM in other contexts as well. So we're hoping um, to, to, to build our, on our N2 experience in the U.S. Uh, globally, um, not immediately, but hopefully in the future. And I've been um, thinking about it uh, in, in London, so we're, we're, I'll share with your colleague we're thinking about connecting with there, as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa with uh, ICAP. And so, uh, uh, Rusi Jasper, we've been discussing how, I mean, this was immediately right before COVID, how we could uh, um, do some of the same work uh, within the context of London. And so really our, our goal is to, you know, reduce new infections um, and reduce, uh, among other things, HIV uh, really health disparities. So let's thank our funders, especially the NIH and CDC, 
and really thank, you know, I changed this slide, I think last week to highlight, you know, that we're all meeting on Zoom, but thank our team who's been, uh, of course, really helpful in terms of our projects. Um, I went a little bit over, I think by 10 minutes, um, but yeah, entertain any questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Duncan, for a wonderful talk. Of course. Um, at this point, we'll be starting the Q and A. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, please use the raise your hand function in the participant area, um, and I will go through that way. If you have questions that you'd like to put through the chat, feel free to put them there, and I can read them off. And um, we will go in order. I think we had one question in the chat during the talk. We, we did. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, no, take it away. I think. You oh, yeah, well, I was just going to say it was, it was a question. I don't know how to. Oh, here's the chat. The chat is any data on native slash indigenous populations. Yes. There may be. I'm not aware of that, though, honestly. Um, so I really can't speak to that. Um, but overall, we know that minority individuals typically have um, worse health, um, including when it, when it comes to HIV. Um, the, the data that I, I'm immediately familiar with is really COVID-related data, where we know that actually Native Americans have had the, the highest rates of, of, of COVID-related hospitalizations um, in, in the country, um, which is, you know, disappointing. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Thomas Long. Uh, Thomas, go ahead. Thanks, Nana. And Dr. Duncan, a, a really fine talk uh, and, and really important work. Just a quick question about um, uh, hookup apps uh, like Grindr and others. Are, are you looking at all at, uh, at their role in uh, some of these behaviors? Yeah, I appreciate that, Thomas. Um, I think that we have done some initial work looking at hookup apps like Grindr, especially. Well, one, um, characterizing app use. So we've done some work where, we, where we've shown that, for example, Jack is more popular among Black MSM than Grindr. I mean, we've heard that and thoughts that based on interacting with our participants, but we empirically demonstrated that. Um, and we've done a number of studies where we recruited participants from uh, apps. Um, including our like some uh, initial work in Atlanta, some work in Paris and London, um, for various reasons. Um, we have done some work looking at you know whether hookup apps are uh, the, in and of themselves a risk factor for HIV acquisition. And my sense of the literature is that it's all over the place. It's really mixed. Um, partially, there's a lot of selection bias and who engages in app use, um, um, and then what people do when it comes to app use. We we've demonstrated that. There is, I've given that another kind of talk, but about app use, um, that um, there's a lot of substance use in the, in the context of app use and other kind of HIV risk behaviors, but in the context of N2, we're not studying, excuse me, we're not studying app use in, in that way. Um, we do ask, characterize like things about app use, but it's just, I think it's only one part, I have to go back to that slide, but it's only one cycle we're assessing that, but we're not looking at whether app use may be a, uh, um, uh, risk factor HIV in, in our study. But I think one thing to note is that it, it would be awesome um, in an ideal world for us to also be able to, in real time, which is why I'm, I'm excited about our EMA study, to assess you know, what, what people are doing, right? Are they using apps right now when they're traveling to certain locations? Um, to really make meaning and to connect neighbors and networks a little bit more rigorously. Um, but we're not, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. There, Two questions. Yeah, I'll sorry. jump in quickly. Um, thank oh, you so much for that. I um I think you you just touch on so many topics that are so timely, and I really appreciate your points about um moving beyond individual level factors. Um, <clears throat> and you just you you just touch on the you know potential and possibilities, you know, and and you know what you're currently doing to address that. So I really appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about your just some more details on your longitude on your longitudinal GPS data. I just wasn't able to quite capture like how you do it, how long you follow individuals, how individuals yeah. are providing the data, um, how you use it. I mean, you did like you know I saw the pictures of it, um, but just some more details on like. I don't know, I guess like the practical application of it. I would no, 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 totally. Yeah, this was just kind of a real broad overview, so I didn't dig into that. Apologies. One, Lisa, really, your work has really been an inspiration to me, really. <laughs> um, 
No, ser ser seriously, um, and really important, um, including the work on medical mistrust, but just the overall looking at context, like when, you know, like I, I'm, I'm teaching now at, at Columbia and, you know, I, I remind students like, they're like, well, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna see more context. To the, you know, the, the, the module that I'm teaching is all about social epi, right? And I'm like, well, you know, that's great. And we could talk about it, but the studies I'm presenting when it comes to SGM, there are not a lot. Like that's, that's that's kind of the point, and and they're like, well, I want more. I'm like, well, that's great. You know, I hope that you carry this on. Like that's part of the goal. Um, so, I've been interested in neighborhoods separately for a while, of course. And again, we use GPS methods because we think it's among the best ways to to study neighborhoods or really activity spaces. Really. Um, so what we do is we ask participants to wear a GPS device for two weeks. I can talk about. Um, I know if time's coming up. I can talk about the you know why two weeks. Um, some, we have another study with transgender women right now. We're doing one week for other reasons. Um, and we collected the data over uh, uh, participants every six months. So for Chicago, we'll have it uh, for every, you know, every six months for, sorry, uh, two weeks for, for, for up to two, you know, two years worth of data. And so right now what we do is we define, and I didn't describe this in this talk, but we define it as an overall activity space. So it's a little hard to draw with my finger, but you know, but like an overall space around where people go. Um, and then what we're doing is a, you can imagine though that people travel, like I'm in a co-working space now, people travel um, uh, places, but they're not, the, 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 uh, as they travel, they're not, the, they're, they're, the, the dots or, or, they're, or they're, they're not at the, the same, that, that sorry. They're not at that place for the same amount of time. The differential amounts of time that people spend in places, right? So what we're also doing, um, so activity space is the standard in the in the field in terms of GPS. So that's great. We're doing the standard, but we recognize that there's still issues there. So what we're also doing is looking at the density of points, and we're creating buffers around places that are are, are higher density. So that's actually like one of my options is really defining neighbors in that way. Um, but I'll say the following, and I didn't talk about it here because I, I wanted to give a kind of broader overview of the, the project. Um, we are finding that, not surprising, that GPS neighborhood definitions really do matter. So we have a, a paper that it looks like it should be accepted soon, hopefully, um, where we look at um, uh, GPS defined activity spaces and prep use, and we find that GP, that uh, 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 G, uh, more prep clinics, sorry, more prep clinics within GPS defined activity spaces associated with more prep use, but we don't find the same association we define neighborhoods as census tracts or a buffer around someone's home. Um, there are still many issues that I could talk about there, like there's still selection bias, right? I didn't randomly decide to come to a co-working space today. I came here because I wanted to, I didn't want to be at home, I'm kind of fatigued, blah, blah, blah. So. Thank you. I think I'll, I'll email you because I think it'd be helpful to talk more and I don't want to okay. have other people's time so we can, that's very helpful and I will follow up with you on it. Okay, perfect. And I think there was one last question in the chat box okay. about, um, it's from Vigil asking, has your group been able to theorize why there's a high rate of PrEP discontinuation amongst black MSM? Honestly, we haven't. So as I've been thinking about PrEP, there's so many colleagues, particularly like ISGEM colleagues, like Michael Newcomb, et cetera, has, who's really been focusing on, on the PrEP continuum of care and really the, the other, like the later aspects, like discontinuation, et cetera. We haven't been doing as much work in that. Um, we're starting to think through that, but also how do you, operationalizing that contract I think is rather complex, um, but we haven't dug deep into that. Um, my assumption or my, my thoughts is that, well, I, I'm not gonna talk about that because I'm, I'm not really sure, honestly. Um, but I do, I do think a lot of people discontinue PrEP because of relationships, right? Um, and or not experiencing, in, in, uh, not um, having uh, planned sexual encounters. What we are doing is we have in our COVID survey, we ask many things about, and I have a meeting at 130, sorry. Um, but we have um, uh, 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 many items about prep use. And so one of our, our, our former fellows, now faculty, she's working on a paper right now to looking at prep use. And so I maybe, and we do have prep discontinuation items. So maybe we can start to, to, to answer that and address that part of the literature or fill that voice, excuse me, in the literature. But I think that's another area that's, from my perspective, and you know, it's an area of right for investigation. There's not a lot of work there, particularly in, overall, but including when it comes to black and black. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to, thank I have you so much. <laughs> okay. Oh no, that's thank okay. You. You're all right. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate thank this. You. All right, thank everybody. Thanks everyone for attending. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Nana.
No problem.